Git. Aside from being a slightly rude name to call somebody, Git is a version control system. In fact, without a doubt, it is the industry standard version control system. Nowadays, it is a must for every developer to know how to use Git. And in this series of videos, I'm gonna teach you everything you need to know about it, so that by the end of all of this, you will know how to fully use Git, the way that it was intended. In the terminal, of course. Let's do this. Hello folks, my name is Ben and welcome back to the channel. A very quick reminder before we dive into any of this stuff to please hit that subscribe button if you enjoy what I do on this channel, it really helps me out. And of course, if you want to get notifications about any of my new videos, please make sure you hit that bell icon to be notified. Okay, so for anybody that knows me, they know that I'm a complete and utter Git nerd. I love it. And I even teach interactive courses, both at work and universities, on how to use Git. And my aim over all of the videos in this mini series is to take all of that wonderful information and pass it on to you. Right, let's start with the basics. What is a version control system? Let me highlight a couple of problems that exist when creating software or code or in fact anything that is on a computer. For example, let's say you have a file called budget estimates. You need to now make changes to that file and save it. But of course you want to keep a backup of the old one just in case something goes wrong. So you call the new file budget estimates underscore two. Okay? Again, you need to now make changes to the file, but you want to keep a version of the old one for backup just in case. So you call the new file budget estimates underscore two underscore new and so on. And this name suffix additions adds on and on and on until you have maybe 50 copies of the same file in a folder with all sorts of different variations of suffixes and endings and possibly you even lose track of which one is the most recent up-to-date one. Version control systems get rid of this problem entirely. Here's another one. Let's say that you're working on a code base on your own. That's fine, it's just you and the code. What happens when it's multiple people working on the same individual code base? Let's take one step further. What if it's multiple people all working on the exact same file? How do they all manage their changes between one another? Version control systems get rid of this problem entirely. And one more, let's say that you have a code base and you've been working on it. A new person joins your team, let's call that new person Steve. How are you going to get all of those files from your machine to Steve? And then after you've done that, when you've made changes, how are you gonna sync Steve's files again? And you make new changes and you've gotta sync his files again. You're not exactly gonna copy all of those files onto a USB stick walk over to his desk and give him the stick every single time you make a change to a file, are you? Version control systems deal with this problem entirely. Version control systems as a concept is a system that records changes to a file or set of files over time. As your code base changes, the history of the code base grows. In centralized version control systems, there is usually one point where the true version of the code exists, perhaps in a server somewhere in the cloud, or wherever it is, and client machines, users or developers, connect to that machine and check out copies of the code, make changes to it, and then send it back to the machine. Those are centralized version control systems. Git is slightly different. It is a distributed version control system. And we'll talk about why that is different in just a second. Using a version control system has some major, major advantages, especially when it comes to working in a team of developers. Not only that, but it enables this sort of snapshot, this versioning, this going back in time in case you make a mistake feature. It lets you revert back to previous versions in case something goes wrong. Version control systems also enable ownership. They let you see within the history who's done what change and why. And of course, it allows for synchronization. So when I make a change, everybody gets that change. So Git is slightly different from the usual centralized version control system. Git is distributed which means that everybody has a copy of the entire repository on their own machine. So that on each and every person's machine, they have the full history of the repository. There isn't one single source of truth for that code base. It is distributed. It is on everybody's machine. A distributed version control system like Git has some fantastic benefits, including, but not limited to, so if the centralized repository 
broke or corrupt or disappeared or something went wrong, then not everything is lost. Everybody has a full version of the repository on their machine. It also means that you can still make changes and commits to your version of the repository on your machine without having to have a connection to the internet or to your server that has the single source of truth in the case of a centralized version control system. As I said before, Git is the industry standard for version control systems. Everywhere that I have worked has used Git as their version control system. Nowadays, it's an absolute must that developers know how to use Git. And that is what this mini series is all about. One final piece of theory before we head into the terminal. Git works by storing snapshots or sort of still images of what your project looks like now in this moment in time. These are called commits in Git. You can imagine that this is like doing a save for your entire project, but as you keep hitting save, the history grows bigger and bigger and a commit is made for every single save. We'll talk a little bit more about commits later on in this video. To install Git on your local machine, you can head to the link provided in the description down below, git-scm.com forward slash downloads, and click one of the links up here to download the relevant um, installation for your operating system. This entire mini series is gonna cover how to use Git from in the terminal, from the command line, which of course is how it was intended to be used and of course gives you the most control when you use it. However, after you've watched this series, if you really don't like using the terminal or the command line, feel free to use a GUI. There are many, many, many Git GUIs out there. And in fact, the Git SCM downloads page actually includes a link to view GUI clients. And you click on that and it will show you a huge variety of GUI clients that are available to you instead. Once you've installed Git on your system, you can test that it's working by going to the command line and typing git space hyphen hyphen version and hitting enter. And if you get a number there or something telling you the version, that means it's been installed correctly and you're good to go. Otherwise, something may have gone wrong in the installation process. Very quickly, a side note. A lot of people use Git and GitHub interchangeably, and that's wrong. I want to correct that now. Git, of course, is the software that we're looking at today, whereas GitHub actually is an online website that acts as a remote repository, if you wish to use it as such, for your projects that use Git as its version control system. Basically, GitHub runs on Git. There are, of course, several alternatives to uh, GitHub when thinking about a remote repository. There's Bitbucket and GitLab as well. We'll talk about remote repositories a bit later on in the series. Now, back to the terminal. The very first part of interacting with any Git repository is knowing if it's going to be a brand new repository or if it's an existing one that you are joining onto, if you like. If it is a brand new one that you're creating, then you're gonna be using the git init command. However, if it's one that you're joining onto that already exists, you're going to be pulling down the repository and its history by using the git clone command. Let's look at both. The first option is the simplest. If you are starting this git repository from scratch, I am in a folder on my machine called git series. And inside that folder, I have one file called notes.txt. This currently isn't a git repository. I can use git commands, git status, for it to tell me fatal, this is not a Git repository. Basically, this is still just a folder. To turn this folder into a Git repository, I simply type the command git space init, git initialize. Hit enter, it tells me some information, and it now is a Git repository. If I clear the screen and type git status now, it tells me I'm on the master branch, initial commit, untracked files, and so on. This is now a Git repository. Important to note, the file notes.txt hasn't been affected in the slightest. When you first initialize a Git repository, your files won't be affected. If, however, you are joining an existing Git repository, you'll need to use the git clone command, and you'll need to know where you're finding the repository that already exists, in which remote repository it is in. As I said before, GitHub, Bitbucket, and GitLab, for example, are remote repositories. They are servers, they are websites that hold Git repositories remotely for many people to access across the world and across the internet. I'm gonna use this repository as an example. This is one of my repositories that I have on GitHub, the where repository. I'm gonna to go to this green button over here, clone or download, and I'm gonna copy this URL, this HTTPS github.com cardelio where.git. The dot git at the end is important. I'm gonna copy that, I'm gonna go back to the terminal, and I'm gonna go git, clone and paste in that URL. I'm gonna hit enter, it's gonna go cloning, 
And now, if I ls, there is a folder called where, which is the name of the repository. I'm going to move into that. I'm going to clear the screen, and I'm going to list the files. And there are the files, the how to use and the where file. The how to use and the where file both exist on my machine. I've basically taken a copy of that repository, the entire repository and all of its history onto my machine, hence the distributedness of Git. Regardless of how your journey starts with a Git repository, whether it's from initializing it from scratch or joining it by cloning it, the rest of the procedure will be the same. For the rest of this video, I will be using the Git series folder, so the brand new repository that I created. As you can see in my terminal, I've made some sort of fancy changes to my PS1, that's this prompt line that you can see here. I'm gonna turn these off for the rest of the tutorial so it'll be more realistic to what you will see when you first use Git. So I'm back in this git underscore series folder and I have the file notes.txt. I've used the git init command to turn this into a git repository. On a side note, if you're wondering what actually makes a folder a git repository on your machine, like what is different in this folder that makes it a git repository, I've actually done a full video on that before and I'll link to it in the description down below and probably pop up one of those fancy cards above me now. The next command I wanna show you is the git status command. This simply just says, hey, what is the status of my repository right now here on my machine? So I'm gonna type in git status and it's gonna tell me a bunch of things. The first thing it's gonna say on branch master. We're gonna talk about branches a little bit later but that's incredibly important to version control systems, especially git. It says initial commit and then it says untracked files. At the bottom it says nothing added to commit but untracked files are present. To translate all of this, it basically says we haven't tracked anything in our version control system. Nothing's in the history, nothing's been committed, nothing's been saved. But the file notes.txt is in red because it has been changed since the last time. And of course the last time is just nothing. So from nothing to something, there's a change. It's red because it's been changed and it says changes have happened, we can now save those changes, we can start adding them. To summarize, if you see any files in this list, they've either been changed, deleted, or added. If for some reason your output here isn't colorized, and for example, your notes.txt isn't in red, you can tell git to colorize the output, make it a bit more easy to read by using the command git space config space color, spelt the American way, dot ui space true git config color.ui equals true. You're basically saying, hey, in my git configuration, I wanna turn colors on. Hit enter and you should see colors from now on. The git status command is a really great quick way of having an overview of your local machine and what has changed on it. So as you change files, the git status command will tell you what's getting changed. The next command I wanna tell you about is the git add and the git commit command, but this is where a little bit of complexity comes into Git. And I have a really nice analogy that will help people understand this next component of Git. So because Git is a distributed version control system, it means that everybody has a copy of the repository on their machines. And with that comes a little bit of confusion. And this is where a lot of people sort of give up with Git at the initial stages of the, the terminal interaction, because it's sort of confusing how changes and files move inside of just your own machine before even leaving it. And the bit that confuses the most people is this bit that I've highlighted on this slide. So just inside your local machine, these three columns, these three areas that file changes go through before they're sort of saved, before they're sort of committed. Okay, and I'm gonna explain them now and give you an analogy to help you remember them. It is the working copy, the staging area, and then the local repository. They're sort of you know, locked into the history, the local repository on your machine. And here is a really silly analogy that will help you remember how files move from one column to another and the commands associated with that movement. So the analogy I want you to try and remember when thinking about just your local machine and moving Git changes through those three columns is that you are a child in a kitchen and you are baking cookies with the eventual aim of putting them into a basket of cookies and putting them underneath the Christmas tree and eventually, when we're talking about the remote, which we're not doing in this lesson, giving them to your mother as a gift, for example. Okay, so you are the child, the cookie is the work, the code, whatever it is that you're changing, and the kitchen is the first area. You're actually doing the work, you're modifying, you're baking the cookies in 
the working directory. So the working directory is the kitchen and you are baking the cookies and the cookies are the work. When you're happy with a cookie, you're like, yes, this is a good piece of code, this is a good piece of work. You're gonna use the command git add to take the cookie, take those changes, and put it into a basket of cookies, okay? Git add to put it into a basket of cookies. The basket is the next stage, the next column. This is the staging area, okay? This is like a middle area from just being worked on to sort of saved and locked into the history of the repository. This is this middle area that lets you pick what changes you want to add to the basket by using git add. And when you've got a basket you're happy with, you use the command git commit, and that's that save command, git commit to take all of those changes, that basket of cookies, that collection of changes, and commit them, save them, stick them underneath the Christmas tree. Of course, underneath the Christmas tree, there'll be a bunch of different cookie baskets, and those are all your previous commits. And of course, the Christmas tree is sort of just an analogy for the local Git repository, but that's just the local Git repository on your machine. It still hasn't left your machine yet. So the kitchen is the working directory. You're actually making the changes. When you're happy with the change, use git add to put it in the staging area, the cookie basket, the middle ground before you sort of save it. When you're happy with your basket of changes, your multiple files that you've changed, you git commit to save it, to lock it into the history of the repository. A lot of people get confused with the staging area. Why not just sort of take all the changes and save it? The staging area is Git's way of giving you far more control. You can make changes in your working directory on maybe five files and only take two files into the staging, um, into the staging area for your commit. So it gives you full control of what you actually want to put into the basket and stick under the tree so that you don't just have to do everything if you didn't want to. Now that we know that, let's add our change, our notes.txt, which in fact, let me just show you, has some text in it. It says, here are some notes. Okay, I'll just even add some more here to show you. Um, there are more notes. Oh, I can't even spell. There are more notes here. We're going to save that and close, and we're going to do git status again very quickly just to see that the file notes.txt still is untracked. It's currently untracked. Git has no knowledge of it. Okay, when a file is untracked or whether it's been changed, whatever whatever situation it's in, if there's something different than it was before, you use the command git add and the file name to take that set of changes, take that cookie and stick it in the basket. When you hit enter, nothing particularly will happen, but let's run git status again to see the change, whatever's going on here. Um, again, it tells us the same thing, but now notes.txt isn't read anymore. It says, ah, there's changes to be committed. There's changes that are in the basket, in the staging area, in the middle bit, to be stuck under the tree, to be committed, to be saved. As a side note, if you had multiple files and changes that you wanted to add all at the same time, instead of using all of their files names, you can just do git space add space dot, and the dot will just add all of the changes Okay, so we've put our notes.txt in the staging area, in the cookie basket. Let's now do the next command and the final command of this video to take that basket of cookies, that at the moment just contains one cookie, and save it into our git history, into our git repository. And that, of course, is the git commit command, okay? If you type in git commit without anything else, just on its own, and hit enter, it will open up a git commit message inside of your editor. My editor of choice, of course, is Vim. And here, what it wants me to do is actually give a message about this commit, about these changes. And normally, you'd put in some information about what has changed in this commit. So in this one, I might say, I have added the file called notes.txt. And actually, that's a really terrible example of a commit message. Please don't use that as a commit message because you can see what files have changed already. You don't need a commit message to do that. But this video isn't about commit messages. Once you've done that, you'll save and exit and git will commit for you. It'll be saved into history. The alternative to using git commit on its own is using git commit with the minus m argument, so the message. And then inside of strings, you can put whatever message you like. And this means that it will skip the whole editor opening process where you have to type in your message there and you can just do it in a single command here. So instead, my commit message will be here and it'll be, I have added the notes file uh -huh. and hit enter and it will be committed. If you had a problem, if you had a warning message pop up when you tried to use the git commit command saying something about a name and an email address, then you need to run these two commands to fix that. Git config 
space dash dash local space user dot name space and then your name that you want to attach. It's basically asking you for the author's information so that it can put the author's information into the commit. So I'm going to just do Ben and the other command is git config almost the same dash dash local um, user dot email instead. So the name and the email and I'm just going to put in a, a, a bogus one at the moment ben at ben dot com. Okay. And now I've added my author's credentials. So when I do commits, those credentials will be added as part of the commit. So if you had a problem with commits, that's how you fix it, those two lines. It's always good to use the git status command as often as possible to see the state of your repository. And right now we've just committed. It says there's nothing to commit. The working tree, the working directory is clean. There's no new changes. Everything is as it was in the recent commit. So the commit that we've just done. The last command I want to show you in this video is the git log command. And the git log allows us to look back in history and see all of our commits. It simply prints all of the commits that we've done. So if we type git space log and hit enter, we can see there is one commit there. There's the one that we did there with our author, who I was, who I am that did the commit message, our commit message itself, and of course the time and date that that happened. Let me really quickly wrap up this video by going through that process once more with a different change and committing so you can see multiple commits in the git log. I'm going to very quickly change the notes file. I'm going to go to the bottom and add um, here is the last line. I'm going to save the file. I'm going to do git status. Always do git status as often as you possibly can. You can see it says that the notes file has been modified. I'm going to git add dot because I'm lazy. Uh, dot means again add all the changes. I could instead do git add and notes but I'm lazy so I'm going to do git add dot which will add all the changes. I'm going to do git status again to see the changes. Always git status. Um, Notes.txt now is in green. It's been modified but it's in our staging area. It's in our cookie basket. We took it as a cookie, put it in the cookie basket and now it's ready to commit. We can do git commit to commit all of the things in our cookie basket. I'm going to attach a message here in the in the command line so I don't need to go into an editor. I'm going to say um, added a third line. Hit enter and git commits into our local repository. I'm going to clear the screen and I'm going to type git log and show you now instead of there just being one commit, there is two commits and it's the newest one at the top. So added the third line is at the top. So that's it for this video. We've learned what a version control system is. We've learned what Git specifically is, and we've learned the first stages of how to use it in the terminal. We've learned six commands, the git init, git clone, git status, git add, git commit, and git log. And in fact, we also learned uh, the git config command to add our user credentials, but there's a bit more complexity to that, and we'll talk about that later on another video. So hopefully you understand just the very first basic bits of Git in the terminal. Please keep your eye out for future videos in this mini series of Git, where I explain everything about Git. This was just the first one. And of course, to be notified about that video when it releases, please make sure you're subscribed and hit the bell icon to get notifications about new videos. Please like this video if you enjoyed it and share this channel around to anybody that you think needs to know about Git. See you in the next video.